Welcome to Conversations. I'm Mukhtar Khan, your host, and I'm coming to you from the temporary studios of uh, Conversations in the eastern side or the Asian side of Istanbul uh, from Uskudar. I'm here in Istanbul to attend. I mean, the conference is over. Uh, I attended a conference called Contemporary Muslim Thought. This conference was sponsored by YTB, a government foundation that seeks to promote uh, education as well as uh, uh, an outreach to to, uh, to Turkish people who live abroad uh, and uh, uh, platform magazine, the Ilk Foundation, which is uh, like a, uh, a knowledge-based foundation that tries to promote uh, dialogue and understanding uh, between scholars from all over the world. Uh, with uh, uh, Turkish students and Turkish scholars. Uh, and also ISIN, which is an extraordinary library, produces encyclopedias and also has a university of its own. So this uh, conference of contemporary Muslim thought brought uh, 23 speakers uh, who spoke about various issues for about uh, two days, uh, four panels on each day, uh, and they came from four continents. There were scholars from, from the US, uh, from Europe, from Africa, as well as Asia. And what was interesting is that nearly every scholar who spoke actually represented multiple countries. For example, like me, I'm an Indian American, so uh, I speak from multiple perspectives uh, as an American Muslim, as an American, uh, as an Indian American. So it was a very interesting uh, conference uh, and it was planned a few months ago. It was planned to discuss uh, the trends in Muslim thinking uh, currently. And uh, it is also part of uh, various volumes that have been published. Uh, and these are exceptional. I also contributed uh, to contemporary Muslim thought from South Asia uh, and uh, with one of my graduate students. Uh, so basically, this was a fantastic experience. It allowed us to interact. And given the fact that there is a major crisis taking place in the Middle East, uh, this also became an opportunity to formally and informally discuss uh, what was happening uh, in Gaza, what were the antecedents to this crisis, and what are the consequences of the crisis, uh, how, how do people from various countries uh, see this, uh, and so on and so forth. So one of the things or the themes that uh, uh, was readily apparent was that there is so much in common uh, for Muslim experience from various different countries that Muslim scholars are able to speak uh, with each other uh, with great deal of intersubjective understanding. Uh, but there is also differences uh, depending upon where they come from, uh, so it was very interesting uh, to participate in a really intense dialogue, both formally and informally. We were all staying uh, in the same hotel. We were eating together uh, and going out for dinners, etc. So the conversation never ended uh, throughout the two days. It started in the morning, went out till late at night. And then even when we went out for walks to have ice cream or baklava, we were still talking about the issues that we cared about. So I have about... 10 takeaways uh, from this conference. And I wanted to share with all of you what these 10 uh, takeaways are. Number one, I found that, and, and this is no surprise, uh, uh, this is rather a banal observation, is the diversity of scholars. The scholars who participated, even though there were only two dozen of them, and one of them could not unfortunately make it. So we had only 23 speakers. Uh, besides uh, the moderators, there was a huge diversity of scholars. People came from different ethnicities. There were South Asians, there were Arabs, there were Malays, there were Africans, uh, and there were Europeans. So people came from uh, different ethnicities, different nationalities. There were scholars from Malaysia, there were scholars from, like I said, from the US, from Turkey, from Egypt, uh, Syria. 
in other parts uh, of the uh, of the globe literally uh, but also what was interesting where people were coming from different methodological uh, perspectives in social sciences there were historians there were theologians sociologists political scientists scholars of international relations and geopolitics uh, and also islamic scholars with some traditional background uh, but what was interesting is that uh, one of the key issues really was, at least from this point of view, was uh, that there were two moods uh, that added to the diversity of the scholars. One mood seemed to be very optimistic uh, about uh, these so-called Islamic resurgence and pan-Islamic uh, Muslim identity. And then there was also a despondency where people seemed to be uh, at a loss, uh, at the failure of uh, uh, Islamic resurgence and the failure of largely the Muslim world uh, to make a very coherent and powerful response to what was going on in Gaza, while we can lament and scream about Islamophobia and genocidal violence, there's no concrete steps that the Muslim world is able to take to stop it now. Uh, and so there was a lot of despondency uh, about this. Uh, so the Debates where uh, is is the Ummah united? If it is united, then why is it so ineffective? Uh, maybe it is powerful. Uh, it has a lot of wealth. The, the GDP should be close to, I guess, more than $10 trillion uh, for all the Muslim countries. I have not done the math, uh, but I'm guessing it will be around that figure or at least it would be the fourth biggest economy uh, after the US, China uh, and Europe. Uh, very powerful countries, uh, uh, but uh, they are unable to work together. So either the Umma is powerless or, or it is powerful, but because it is not united and it is divided, it is not able to act in concert. So people were talking about these things. We were discussing this over lunch uh, uh, and in forums, public forums. And it was also interesting to note that since people came from different countries, uh, the, the the culture from where they came uh, and their outlook uh, was clearly, there was a huge range of ways in which uh, Muslims were looking uh, at different political perspectives. So that was fascinating that the diversity among scholars in perspectives and methodologies and epistemologies and approaches. So that was my first approach uh, that uh, the diversity is, is, is essentially a strength, but it would also uh, lead to different directions uh, in terms of focus and study. Uh, the second observation that to me was interesting, and this came out more in informal discussions than formal discussions, that there are many different perspectives uh, about what Hamas did on October 7th, Hamas's terrorist attack uh, on, on Israel that killed about 1,200 uh, of which many were civilians and women and children were also not spared. Uh, so while there were those who were who definitely recognized it as something that was wrong and horrible, uh, and also pointed out that it ultimately has resulted only in bringing more pain and misery and de destruction to Palestinians, uh, nearly 13,000 Palestinians have died, many of them children, over 5,000, the whole Gaza Strip is nearly destroyed. Civilian institutions, infrastructure, refugee camps uh, have all suffered immensely as a result of what Hamas did. But then there are others who pointed out that uh, look at the West Bank. This year has been one of the worst. Over 250 uh, Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank. There is no Hamas there. Uh, there is a steady loss of land. Israel continues to build settlements, illegal settlements, and basically steals uh, Palestinian land, earmarked for uh, an independent Palestinian state. On top of that, Gaza has been, you know, uh, uh, blockaded for 16 years, or 15, 16 years. Uh, and so it has already been dehumanized. Uh, the citizens of Gaza have suffered so much. Uh, that they have been dehumanized through their suffering, and now we are trying to hold them up to such high moral standards, moral standards which the world is not willing to hold Israel to, but is demanding Hamas uh, from Hamas. So there were a lot of different perspectives about how people saw uh, whether Hamas did. Some people even argued that Hamas has successfully brought back uh, the Palestinian 
uh, crisis uh, to the center of global politics as it was being ignored and marginalized because of the Ukraine war and the Abrahamic Accords and so on and so forth. So, so there was a different perspectives on Hamas and it was very interesting that conversations were very rich, very frank, uh, and uh, and people, even when they disagreed with each other very profoundly, were quite respectful to each other, as I said, both in formal and informal discussions. Um, there were interesting observations made about India. This is my third uh, takeaway. Uh, and uh, to paraphrase one of the speakers, uh, he said, he pointed out that India is both confused uh, and confusing. And this presents a great dilemma uh, to the Arab and the Muslim world because uh, given uh, the, the Hindu first policies of India's Bharatiya Janata Party and, and the posture that uh, Prime Minister Modi has adopted, uh, it is difficult to include India uh, as a member of the Muslim world, even though it has over 220 uh, million Muslims, the third biggest country with the Muslim population. And because of that, it cannot be excluded. So the dilemmas for Muslims, uh, Muslim countries and groups such as OIC and others is we can't exclude India, but we at the moment we can't even include it. So, so it's very confusing for, for these nations on how to deal. So I found this particular take quite interesting uh, uh, because India keeps talking about its foreign policy is something which has strategic clarity, that they're pursuing strategic autonomy, autonomy and national interest. Yet uh, students from other countries of Indian foreign policy uh, seem to think that India's foreign policy is confusing and, and also perhaps reflects uh, some de degree of confusion uh, on the part of Indian thinking. Uh, one of the... Uh, things that I notice, and this is my fourth observation, is the popularity of the decolonial perspective, uh, decolonizing knowledge, uh, essentially trying to build authentic uh, perspective about the world, which is uh, uh, independent of the interests of the West, the language of the West, the narratives of the West. So the popularity of the decolonial perspective was interesting scholars from both um, uh, those who live in uh, and teach in the West, as well as those who live in post-colonial societies in the global South, uh, were leaning uh, very much towards uh, the, the decolonial perspectives. Uh, it also generates new forms of anti-Westernism when it comes to geopolitics, uh, uh, but it is also a rejection of Western epistemologies, uh, in particular neoliberalism as both racist and oppressive. Uh, and there's obviously very strong critique uh, of uh, the West, Western forms of democracy and Western promotion of democracy. So the fifth observation that I, I, I want to make is that uh, it came from Iran um, and uh, it came as a bit of a surprise to me too. Uh, and this is something that uh, is one of the interesting things that I'm taking back as new learning for me is that among the people of Iran, there is not much support for Gaza. Uh, and the logic for that apparently is that because the public in Iran is currently opposed to the regime in Iran, they're opposed to the government. They're obviously since the, the killing of Mahsa Amini, there have been continuously protests in many parts of Iran, especially in the Balochistan province. Uh, there is continuous rebellion sort of in that province. So there is opposition to government. And so because the public is hostile towards the government and they see the government's policy as pro-Gaza and perhaps also think that what is happening in Gaza uh, is directly or indirectly a, a responsibility of their own government. So they, it appears that uh, the Iranians are not feeling that sympathetic towards what is happening in Gaza because uh, their anger towards their own government uh, is dampening their enthusiasm for Palestine. So th that is something new uh, for a country that is the only one that celebrates uh, uh, Jerusalem Day and uh, has been such a strong supporter of uh, groups that fight Israel like Hezbollah and Hamas uh, for, for, it, for its public to be not so supportive of Gaza was to me a new insight. Uh, 
as expected, there is near universal disgust and anger at the United States and its uncritical support for what is being seen across the world, nearly everywhere, as Israel's genocidal vengeance war against the Palestinian people. Uh, while the Western narrative tries to cast it as a war between Israel and Hamas, it is not really uh, Hamas that is on the receiving end. It's the ordinary people in Gaza who are being bombarded to death. Uh, and that's why the civilian toll is so high, especially that of children and civilian infrastructure too. So, so there is palpable anger among people, nearly everybody uh, from anywhere in the world. There were so many participants, hundreds and hundreds of professors and graduate students and PhD students who attended the conference, wherever you, whenever you spoke to them about it, there was total anger. I, 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 I did not meet anybody uh, who seemed to have any sympathy or support for the position that the United States has been taking. Uh, they are just aghast and horrified at how much weapons and money the U.S. is continuing to provide even as it sees uh, the genocidal violence that is being perpetrated by Israel uh, with the money and the weapons uh, that the U.S. is providing. Uh, and as an adjunct to that, this is my seventh observation, is the hypocrisy of West on human rights. Now, a lot of people talked about how the West was hypocritical when it came to human rights uh, and even on freedom of speech. So, so the, the way criticism of Israel and US foreign policy, of, especially criticism of Israel is being curtailed uh, on campuses, in universities, in public forums. Uh, the, recent, <laughs> the most recent example is that when bin Laden's letter that he wrote to the Americans way back uh, in 20 years, when it started becoming popular, uh, on TikTok, after it was picked up from The Guardian, The Guardian simply deleted it without providing an explanation as to why. Uh, and so there are, these, there are several, several instances, uh, the pressure on universities, and the targeting of students at Harvard and Columbia, uh, the, the banning of flags, of Palestinian flags, the, the position that the German government is taking that Israel is not violating any international norms while European Union and the United Nations both are pointing out um, that uh, cutting of water, star using starvation as a weapon, uh, destroying civilian infrastructure like hospitals and refugees, all of these constitute uh, crimes against uh, civilians and uh, violations of international law. So besides the, the disgust for one-sided support of Israel, there is also a lot of anger and disgust at the hypocrisy of the West uh, when it comes to human rights, freedom of speech uh, and democracy. No one talks about Palestinian rights uh, only the right of Israel to defend. Apparently, there's only one right in the world, and that is Israel's right to defend itself, no matter uh, what means it uses and no matter who comes in its way. But uh, not once do we hear anything about Palestinian rights to freedom, to dignity, uh, to survive, to life. Uh, the eighth uh, observation that I wanted to make uh, was... Uh, the concern for rise of institutionalized Islamophobia as dissent and criticism of Israel uh, and Western policies is being stifled. So as part of this compression uh, of freedom of speech, uh, it is being cast uh, in an Islamophobic fashion. So there is Islamophobia not only coming from leaders of speeches, the way the media is covering uh, the story, uh, continuing to humanize uh, Israeli and Israeli victims, and which is a good thing, but continuing to dehumanize Palestinians uh, and trying to keep uh, their victims as, as anonymous blobs so that people do not connect with them. So, so there is genuine concern, especially for scholars who live in Europe and in the United States, so they were very concerned about the rise of institutionalized uh, Islamophobia. And they felt that uh, this is going to have a long-term impact on the quality of democracy, on the quality of uh, freedoms uh, that is available uh, to people uh, in, in Western countries. Uh, further highlighting the broad uh, hypocrisy of the, the current Western political culture. Uh, I also wanted to point out uh, and make an observation that in spite of uh, uh, 
the decline of the Turkish lira right now, the US dollar is about 29 Turkish liras, uh, the hospitality and uh, the manner in which the conference was organized was fearless. Uh, uh, broadly in the Muslim world, I have not seen such wonderful uh, manner in which uh, academic conferences are held. In fact, even in the West, while there are the conferences are very big, and lots of scholars come, many associations, and even conferences that are hosted by universities, uh, the intellectual content is always very high, and debates are very intense, etc. But uh, no, but the Turks really know how to treat uh, scholars like rock stars, uh, and uh, and so. Uh, so I just want to tip my hat off to Turkish academia for the enthusiasm with which they participated in this conference. And I want to end with an observation, but also a personal statement. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor uh, Lutfi Sunar, who organized this conference. It's, uh, I understand it's like an amazingly difficult task to put together a team. Uh, such a big team in dealing with scholars coming and going from so many different parts. So I want to personally thank him and also his staff uh, who the conference got over uh, on Sunday and today is Tuesday. And uh, uh, I had a small accident. I was just taking a walk and I turned my ankle uh, and I fell down. It was, it was a terrible experience for about a few minutes. I was kind of dazed. I didn't know what was happening. My phone just flew off and nearly went on the road. Uh, and I think I've hurt myself in many places. <laughs> but it, basically, my foot was hurting and lots of people. It was amazing as to how many people came to my help. Uh, I even tried to count. There were like six, seven men and five, six women who lifted me up and uh, checked me, took off my shoe and were looking at my foot. So it was amazing to see the uh, the concern and love uh, with which the so many strangers uh, came to my help. But what was also incredible was after I came back to the hotel, I somehow managed to come here, uh, finding a cab, uh, that uh, the organizers of the conference, when they found out about it, they immediately came, took me to the hospital, and got me x-rayed. And so, yes, uh, my foot is going to be very difficult. I'm traveling to Macedonia tomorrow. Uh, so it's going to be difficult and painful, but it's not, uh, I have not broken any bones, so I'm quite happy about it. But I'm very grateful for the conference organizers who've done such a fabulous job of taking care of us. Uh, I also want to thank you all for watching this and uh, do subscribe to Conversations, uh, like this video, make sure you share it with your friends and your colleagues. Uh, uh, and until next time, uh, this is your host, Muhtadar Khan.